Trigger warning. Just trigger warning. If those words hold any meaning to you at all, if there is any action which you cannot bear to see depicted on screen, then it may be time to turn around. You have been warned. In this world, is the destiny of mankind controlled by some transcendental entity or law? Is it like the hand of God hovering above? At least it is true that man has no control, even over his own will. Welcome to a new series where we examine every episode of the various animated adaptations of Kentaro Miura's famous, and in some circles infamous, manga, and how each installment compares to their respective chapters in the original work. Today we'll be examining episode 1 of the 1997 series, The Black Swordsman, and what elements it kept, killed, or recalibrated for its own nefarious purposes. And oh boy are we in for a doozy. While the 1997 series stays quite faithful to the manga, it does take its fair share of creative liberties. And while the bulk of them take place in the latter half of the series, this one episode takes the cake for the simple act of condensing an entire arc of the manga into just under 22 minutes. Perhaps even more impressive, though, is that they managed to pull it off while still presenting a coherent, standalone episode that conveyed all that was needed to set up where the story was eventually headed. Keep in mind, though, that this is a flash-forward episode, and does contain spoilers for the anime, with some fans telling first-time viewers to just skip past it. That's what the movies did, after all. Personally, though, I'd advise against that. This episode casts a shadow over all the rest of the series, showing that no matter how good things may seem, they are destined to end with our hero alone and mutilated. That said, there are spoilers for a major twist in the finale, so if you'd rather stay in the dark, then feel free to skip ahead to episode 2, but just realize, there is no happy ending. Our story begins with a lonely traveler, the titular black swordsman as he trudges through the pouring rain. Nearby, he sees a carriage full of women and children being driven towards the towering castle beyond, while all others around do everything within their power to keep their eyes away from it. He does not. This brief sequence is lifted directly from the manga, almost panel for panel, and personally, I actually think it's a mild improvement. Granted, this was very early on in the manga, so Miura hadn't quite hit his stride, but the slow movement and minimal animation perfectly highlight the somber and unnerving atmosphere set by the fantastic watercolor backgrounds by art director Shichiro Kobayashi. Where Miura's art is known for being highly detailed, Kobayashi chose to implement a more cost-effective art style with softer, less defined edges, but with a heavy emphasis on the lighting of the scene, creating a moody, dreamlike quality to the work. It strikes a fine balance between working within their rigid budgetary limitations and producing something that remained true to the tone and style of Berserk. If there's one drawback to this scene, it's the cart. I know this sounds bizarre, but trust me, You'll understand in time. Just keep that in mind for later. Bartender, have you heard any good news? No, no good news at all. Still nothing? Times have been dark, even in Midland's castle town. The conversation in the tavern is grim, painting a picture of a world cast into shadow in the wake of a new king, who they really shouldn't know about, but that's spoiler talk, so I'll just bite my tongue for now. <gasps> Ladies and gentlemen, I have returned. Better not spill any of my expensive wine. Watch it, you lady. If you spill it, I'll make you lick it off the table. Colette! Please, let Colette go. I'm begging you. <clears throat> Shut up, old man. And mind your own business. Oh, no, Grandpa! This scene right here was all that Kotaku needed to call the 2016 reboot the better series, 
since that one featured a more manga-accurate version of the scene where instead of terrorizing a young girl, the thugs are actually tormenting a fairy creature named Puck, whom they tied up and used for target practice. Hey, watch it! Well, quit complaining and hold still like a good little bullseye. Unfortunately, that version of the scene is soul-crushingly hideous and features a character who shouldn't even be there for another several episodes. Ah, oh, shit! What did I do to deserve this? And hey, remember that old man from earlier? Yeah, he's one of the thugs now. And yes, that is him. He and his daughter show up later in that same episode. I guess Guts punched him so hard he became a monk. Getting back on topic, though, it was a smart idea to cut Puck out of the scene presenting a more down-to-earth sequence to ease viewers into this weird and wild world before springing some of the more outlandish fantasy elements on them. Plus, with a non-human fairy, or elf as they're called for some reason, it's easy to imagine people not thinking about them in a very sympathetic light, especially since it's later revealed that not everyone can even see them. Hell, Mira even had to outright tell the audience that the patrons felt bad for him, However, with a young girl being victimized, the revulsion you feel during this scene serves to build up the state of fear the town is held in. After all, even in times like these, how could so many people stand by and watch this happen unless they knew that stopping it would only mean something far, far worse? <laughs> this is when Guts steps into the scene, dispensing with each of the thugs in a simple yet elegantly animated sequence. It's bloody. It's violent but it's beautiful. Especially this. I'll let you live so you can take a message to your master for me. Tell him the Black Swordsman has come. While we did get a glimpse of the Dragon Slayer as it was being forged in an anime original sequence before the OP, this is the first time we get to see it in action. And my god, is it a thing of beauty. The men killed were mercenaries hired by a cannibal warlord known to fans as the Snake Baron who had taken over the town, allowing its people to live in exchange for gold and... food. In the original manga, the kind of food he craved was made very explicit, with Guts even confronting the Lord Mayor about it after he's arrested for disturbing their uneasy truce. I understand. I know all about it. How he's a monster that eats human flesh. I know it very well. And I know that you continue to provide him with his meals. I passed them at the gates of this city. A prison wagon of women and children. This line doesn't make it to the anime, as they removed Guts' arrest altogether. Another wise move, since Puck wasn't there to bail him out this time. And all other references to the Baron's cannibalism are also removed, including one instance where he tosses a severed ear to the mayor when he begs forgiveness for Guts' killings. Maybe this was due to broadcast restrictions, and it really wouldn't be noticeable to a first-time viewer, but most fans of the manga would find it hard not to pick up on this difference particularly since that carriage from the start of the episode doesn't really pay off in any meaningful way anymore, becoming almost a non-sequitur. In the episode's defense, though, there's still plenty of subtext to imply what they weren't quite brave enough to explicitly state. Human food. Money. These things are of no use to me. However, I love to hear humans scream as they burn, and the sound of cracking bones. Master, please! I beg you. You gave me your word that you wouldn't do anything more to harm my people. Did I? Yes, you did. I don't care about them. Let them burn. And so the Baron sets fire to the town, leading his army of mercenaries through only the finest of still frames. Yeah, this is where the budget restrictions are at their most apparent. 
Many times throughout the series, the grandest moments will be represented with a single still frame which the camera pans over. And while it does beautifully capture the feeling of seeing a truly gorgeous two-page spread in a manga, and helps burn the moment more fully into your memory by giving you a single image to remember it by, it also stands out as very, shall we say, uh, cost-effective. It's an understandably divisive aspect of this series, but it doesn't take long to get used to it, especially since almost all of them were hand-painted by our good friend, Mr. Kobayashi. This is also where we get our first track from Susumu Hirasawa's iconic soundtrack, Ghosts. It's chaotic, malevolent, and thrilling, making it the perfect track to score an impromptu raid. Originally, the Snake Baron launched his attack out of contempt and weariness for the mayor's cowardice. In this version, though, with Guts free and in hiding, it's implied that the raid is meant to draw him out, reinforced when Guts finally makes his appearance on the scene. <laughs> He's here. I've heard rumors about you. You're the one who's been making trouble for all of us servants. You, a human. You think you can defy us? <gasps> Abail it. Kill him! What follows is an almost panel-for-panel -panel recreation of their duel, complete with Guts slicing two horses in half using the Dragon Slayer, and the grand reveal of the Baron's true form. Oh, my lord! <laughs> fragile, so fragile. Humans are mere food for us. <gasps> oh, that is just too cool. Guts reaches down to the smoldering remains of the Baron and plucks the mysterious bailet from around his neck. And as he turns to walk off into the burning night, we fade into a matching shot from many years prior, as a young man with a smaller but still much too large sword steps out to fight the Grey Knight Bazuzo. This is a fantastic episode, and an excellent prologue for those who aren't familiar with the manga. The episode uses a simple, straightforward, monster-slaying storyline to guide a fresh audience member through this strange and frightening world, and although it cuts a lot of material out of its respective sources, it retains everything that's important to the series it precedes, allowing all those other details to crop up in a way that tells you, this will be important later, but not right now, inspiring curiosity rather than confusion. It's hardly a one-to-one -one adaptation, but it's still worth noting that the changes made did help streamline the story, and by cutting so much they brought themselves time to really do justice to the scenes they chose to keep, while still retaining the manga's slow, methodical pacing. If you're on the fence about getting into Berserk, I'd advise giving this episode a watch. It's fun, frightening, and although it's not at all like the anime it's a part of, it's a great representation of the franchise as a whole. For those curious about where Guts' quest to kill the God Hand goes from here, don't worry, we'll be covering the continuation of this arc in the Revival series soon enough. For now, though, let's take a step back into the past as we enter the most beloved arc of the manga, The Golden Age. I'll see you guys in Episode 2.